we'd like to do is we'd like to begin our session this evening, our class this evening, with asking a question. And the question is this. What do we think about when we can think about what we want to think about? Because we live in a very invasive and aggressive world. We live in a world that wants to direct the way that we think. And more than ever before, this generation of young people and older people, we need to take the time out to <coughs> really concentrate and to begin to think, or to think like God thinks. The more we do this, the greater the impact. The more we do this, the more it will help mitigate the impact that temptation has on all of us. There is no, brothers and sisters and young people, there is no immunity from temptation. And David's experience in this chapter, in this incident, is all too evident on that score. But this is what David learned. As tragic as this chapter is, this is what David learned. We see in Psalm 51 words that we know oh so well. In Psalm 51, David said, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions, wash me throughly from mine iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. Behold, thou desirest truth. You would have surely recognised all those words. But of course... All of those words are found for us when we have a look at Exodus 34. This is based on the glory of God. David, not you, not yourself, not putting yourself up there, God. And we read of the character of our Heavenly Father in Exodus 34. But oh, sadly, David says this, but spiraling out of that terrible tragedy, he says, according to thy loving kindness, he says, blot out my transgression, blot out my rebellion. This is David, a man after God's own heart. He says, clean me from my iniquity and my sin, my perversion, my distortion of your glorious character. And of course, David says, I have missed the mark. Tragically and terribly have I missed the mark of the glory and the character of God. It's wonderful, though, God left that on record, awful as it is. God left it on record that you and I might see what David saw and see the passion, the, the drama that comes out of this man's life. So, so God does not, when he paints a picture of a person's life, he ignores nothing. When God paints a picture of a person's life, he denies nothing. When God paints a picture of a person's life, he overlooks nothing. And God wants us to look at this chapter and he expects us, brothers and sisters and young people, to think about those experiences that David went through. Why did David lust after a forbidden woman? Why did David trample down every fence that God put up to protect him? Why did David cast aside every obligation Every office that his office demanded. Why did he do that, brothers and sisters? Well, very simply, David was in bed and not in battle. And so there you have the king, and David was the king. David, kings battle. Kings do not lie in bed. A very telling, brothers and sisters, a very telling <laughs> statement. Why did he do it? He was in bed and not in battle. And so there's God's record of disapproval. Kings go forth to battle, but, but David tarried still at Jerusalem. And God says, David, you've neglected the path of duty. David, you've neglected what you have become known for. Have a look, brothers and sisters and young people. Just cast your eye into chapter 10. 
and verse 17. This is the day that we know. This is the day that we've been reading about all the way through these chapters in verse 17 of 2nd of Samuel chapter 10. And when it was told David, David, they're out there. They're coming again, the Syrians. When it was told David, he gathered all Israel together, passed over Jordan and came to heal them. And the Syrians set themselves in array against David and fought with him. And the Syrians fled before Israel and David slew the men, 700 chariots of the Syrians and 40,000 horsemen and smote Shobak, the captain of their host who died there. And when all the kings that were the servants of Hadrat, Esau saw that they were smitten before Israel. They made peace with Israel and served them. So the Syrians feared to help the children of Ammon anymore. David, that is you. That is your duty of service. But you now have neglected that. You know, the Apostle Paul picks up this lesson for you and me. Now look at the context. Second of Timothy. And chapter 2. And we read these words in the second of Timothy, chapter 2. And you see that on the screen. We'll just put that up a little bit larger. But look, look there at this verse 8. Remember the Jesus Christ of the seed of David. <clears throat> ah, so here's David, the reference back to David. And all around that, you have the word strong, endure, good soldier, war, soldier. I endure if we suffer. You know, brothers and sisters, when you look at the Greek in verse 4, you hearken back to David. David, David, you've ceased to go into your service, your right service. When you look at that word warreth, in the Greek it means to make a military expedition. That word warreth there in 2 Timothy means to do military duty, to be on active service. Rotherham translates that expression in verse 4, no one that is serving as a soldier entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. Or the RSV says, no soldier on service gets entangled. David, you need to be on service. You need to be on duty fighting those battles. And then you see, brothers and sisters as we, and young people, as we skip our, our eyes up to verse 3, he reads this. Thou therefore endure. Now listen to this. Endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Do you know what Paul's saying? Rotherham says this. David, he's not talking to David, but David, take your part in suffering hardship as a brave soldier of Jesus. David, take your part. The RSV says, David, share in suffering as a good of Jesus Christ. Take your Therefore, when you go back to the second of Samuel and chapter of David, share, take your part. Well, there's Joab, there's the servants, there's Israel. David, share it with them. Take your part. But he wasn't. He was in bed. He failed to share in the service with others. He neglected his path of duty. You know, brothers and sisters, for David, there was no battle, therefore there was no armor. There was no armor, therefore there was no protection from sin. Now, I know you know these words. I know you know these words, young people, brothers and sisters, very, very well. But I want you to just go to the end of these little words that we know very well and just listen to what Paul's saying and pick up the echo and the connection back to David. Just quickly, if you want to. Just come to Ephesians chapter Yes, the spiritual warrior. Just look at these words that the Apostle Paul gives us and lessons that we can take and lessons that David should take. Ephesians chapter 6. David, don't neglect your Don't fail to share with others. Well, Ephesians and chapter 6. Let me pick up these words. You know the words, verse 11. Wrap around, as it is in the Greek, wrap around yourselves the whole armour of God. Verse 13. Take unto the, wherefore, take unto you the whole armour of God. We get that. We know that. We understand that. But verse 18. 
trying all lunches with all prayers and supplication in the spirit and watching their answer with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. <coughs> you know what Paul's telling us, brothers and sisters? Do you know what Paul's telling us? You think? Paul's telling us if you want to be part of the answer to the common battles with temptation rather than part of the problem, then work in cooperation with righteousness. If you want to be part of the answer and not part of the problem, work in cooperation with righteousness. That means give thought to the way we behave. Give thought to our actions. And that is not easy to do when, brothers and sisters, when it's evening times. That's not always easy to do when it's evening time. Dusk. You know, evening time, brothers and sisters, come back, if you will, to, well, here we are in 2 Samuel in chapter 11. And we'll just enlarge that. It's not easy to do to watch when it is evening time. So we read in verse 2 of 2 Samuel chapter 11, that came to pass in an evening tide that David arose from off his bed. The Hebrew word is dusk. So David there is, is it's dusk. And what's happening here, of course, is that it is this is when day faded into night. This, brothers and sisters and young people, David arose from off his bed when there was not a clear, bright light, or it wasn't pitch black. It was a time of shadows. There were shadows on the roof when he walked, and there were shadows in his mind. This is a very, very dangerous time to watch when there are shadows. When it's not clear, it's not crisp, there's no clear definitions and lines. It is all murky. Shadows on the roof and shadows in his mind. But you know, before brothers and sisters, David. Neglected his path of duty. He failed to share in the service. There was no wrapping around the armour because it was where he was. He neglected duty and therefore he fell into slothfulness. You come with me if you will and read this. Oh, this is so sad to have to lock this in to the man David. You come with me if you will, brothers and sisters and young people of Proverbs 24. Oh, David, do we really need to see you here? Yes, we do, because he was here. He turned into slothfulness. Well, verse 30, Proverbs 4. I went by the field of the slothful, and by the vineyard of the man, void of understanding. No, surely not, David. And verse 31, and lo, it was all grown over with thorns, and nettles had covered the face thereof, and the stone wall thereof was broken down. No, brothers and sisters, stone walls were built to keep out wild animals. This stone wall was not broken down. This stone wall in the Hebrew was thrown down. And that is in the Hebrew. So here is a, a wall to keep out wild animals, and it's thrown down. And then, of course, you have in verse 30. I went by the field of the sloth. And the word in Hebrew means to lean idly. You can see that? Shadows on the roof. Shadows in his mind. He's not sharing the battle with others. He's not on duty. He's not enduring. And he's slothful. He's leaning idly on the balustrade of the roof and just looking as idleness took him on a journey he wished he would never gone on, brothers and sisters, after these events. And so there is, he's leaning idly. And the record says he's void of understanding. The Hebrew is void of heart. David is a man after God's own heart. He's void of heart and void of feelings. That's the Hebrew. Oh, David, no. Please, you're not leaning idly. David, please, no. Shadows fill in your mind. David, please, no. You're not void of heart. You're not void of feelings. Yes, he was. And yes, we can be. 
if we don't take our duty and service and share that with others and wrap ourselves with the armour of God, we can so, so easily, brothers and sisters and young people, fall into that category. Wolves! Wolves! In Proverbs chapter 24, wolves were broken down. God put these walls up around David and he broke them down. Here's the first wall that David broke down. Verse 2. Of 2 Samuel 11. Here's the first wall. Verse 2. And it came to pass in an evening time or tide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. The roof. David, I'm putting a wall around you. The roof. Well, of course, brothers and sisters, some of us in this room would know that. The roof. The roof. By analogy, of course, this is the top of the altar. Now, we won't turn to it. Time will become our enemy if we turn to many, too many of these quotations. But the first time that this word roof is used, you may have in your margin. You may not. The first time in the Bible that this word here in 2 Samuel 11 is used is in Exodus 30 and verse 3. And it is the altar of incense. And it had a roof. And it had walls. And of course the houses were built to mimic the altar of incense. So David is walking on the top of the roof or the altar of incense. From the place of prayer. A wall, God put up, David, where are you? I know there are shadows here, but David, where are you? You're on the top of the altar of incense. You're at the place of prayer. What are you doing leaning idly like a slothful man and letting your eyes take you wherever they will? That's the first wall that God put up. And you know the lesson, brothers and sisters, young people? A place of prayer. Prayer was never designed as a substitute for personal effort and diligence. He's at the place of prayer, but you don't pray and leave it there. Personal effort and diligence has got to be there, locked together with prayer. And here's David. And God put up a wall and he tried it down. Here's David and he's approaching 50. Young people? He's approaching 50 years of age. And if only we could wonderfully pronounce, if only young people we could say, and older brothers and sisters would understand where I'm coming from, if only we could announce that as we grow older, we automatically grow up. If only we could say that. Well, the longer we walked in Jesus Christ, the more we are guaranteed immunity from sin. If only we could say that. But it isn't true. And David's caught out on both accounts. He's caught out on both accounts. The older we grow, do we automatically grow up? Not necessarily. The longer we are in Christ Jesus, do we then guarantee, are we guaranteed more immunity? No, we're not guaranteed more immunity from sin. And here, brothers and sisters, you know, David's caught out. And have a look. Have a look at what happens here, brothers and sisters. Oh, what happened here? I'll push that. Got those dots there? Something happened. <coughs> there we go. Okay. We'll push this. Escape. There we are. Look what happened, brothers and sisters. Here was David caught out on both accounts. Now look at this. There he is, leaning idly in a slothful way. And what does he see as he leans out of the words of Proverbs 20? What does he see? Look at the way the scripture describes it. And from the roof, the wall that God put up around him. No, David, it's not a matter of just prayer. Effort and diligence is required. But what does he see? Bathsheba? Uriah's husband? A woman that he knows? No. He saw a woman. And the woman was beautiful. And David said it quite after, the woman. And in verse 5, and the woman conceived. This is just a woman. David knew nothing about her. 
Nothing about the sweetness of her character, the beauty of her character, the beauty of her mind. Nothing. He looks and just sees a woman. How tragic that was. It meant nothing to him. And therefore, God says, when you trod on that wall and pray down to it, I'm going to put another wall up around you. The woman. So therefore you read in verse 3 these words about this woman. And David said and inquired after the woman. And one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Now you know, brothers and sisters and young people, normally the genealogy of a person is given by the person's name, followed by the father, then the grandfather, and then in some instances, the great grandfather. But this servant says, Is not this Bathsheba the daughter of a lion, the wife of Uriah? David, the lady is married. David, the lady is married. I wonder whether the servant was thinking what David was thinking. She's married. That should have been the end. That's a wall. God put another wall up. But he tried then. Three words that were designed by God to help David's thinking change. Three words Bathsheba, Eliam, Uriah. You know the meanings. Bathsheba, Bathsheba, the daughter of the earth, Eliam, the God of the people, and Uriah, my light is Yah. But you know, brothers and sisters, the links, the echoes in the Bible. Math, Sheba. Do you know the word Sheba is the root word from which we get the word seven? And the very first reference of this word Sheba, seven, the very first reference in the Bible is Genesis 21. What a context. You come with me if you will. Look at the contents. God put a wall up. Genesis 21, the first time we read this word, this Shabbat, the root word from which we get the word seven. <coughs> Look at the context. Look at the lessons flowing out of the things that happened in days gone by David. Learn from the lessons of the past. For this instance, for which you did so. Have a look at Genesis 21. First use of the word Shabbat, from which we get the word seven. There is in verse 23. Of Genesis 21. Now they will swear, Shema, to seven ones self. Swear unto me, hear by God, that thou wilt not deal falsely with me. You have it in verse 24. And I have said, I will, Shema. First time in the Bible. You have it in verse 31. Wherefore he called that place Be it Shema, because there they Shema, both of them. Look at the context. Verse 28. And Abraham set seven ewe lambs. This is the first use of this word in the Bible. Ewe lambs. Do you know the last use? Yes, it is. Second Samuel 12. He had a little ewe lamb, did you write? A little ewe lamb. Talking about that Shema. So here, brothers and sisters, the first time the word Shema is used is in the context of ewe lambs. And the first time the ewe lamb is used here in Genesis 21, the last time it is used is in 2 Samuel and chapter 12. But look at the context. Just turn the page over to Genesis and chapter 20. Not only the ewe lambs here, not only is the first time the word Shema is used, but look at the context. Genesis 20 and verse 2. And Abraham said to Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. Said of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. And Abimelech, king, king of Hura, sent and took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, you are a dead man, for the woman which you have taken, she is another man's wife. Verse 7. Now, therefore, restore the man his wife. What an amazing thing. 
God puts a wall up and says, Be- Be- Bathsheba. She is, you didn't know this day. You, 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 you did it. She was just a woman. <laughs> but she is back. She might. Go back. Go back. Go back to when it's first mentioned. Seven, the covenant number. You lay. Another man's wife. All of that was swirling around there in Genesis. What an amazing thing. What an amazing lesson that it was. All of those might fall into the same sphere of that. But they have remained blind. He's caught up in this. He's a powerful man. And power and wealth eat away at the favour of most men. And in this case, David would be no exception. And for 17 years, David had enjoyed an unbroken spell of prosperity. In every war, David was successful. On every great occasion, the adulation of his subjects only intensified. He was a brilliant organiser this day. He was a brilliant manager. David was a brilliant battlefield strategist. He was the mightiest monarch of the day. And so he sent the messenger and took the Nowhere in the Bible do we have any record of Bathsheba attempting to resist this evil. If she had any kind of this is to young people, as to why the sons had been given. Then the right thing to do would be to excuse us, to remind the king who he really was. But unfortunately, like David, there seems to be a, a caught up in the moment and they lost sight of reality. <coughs> or you might say that she, 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 well, he was the king. How could she not refuse him? You might say, oh, you know, she was innocent. Brothers and sisters, ever got stood up to David? Bathsheba could have done the same thing. They lost sight, both of them lost sight of reality. What was the reality? Young people, brothers, what was the reality? This was the reality that they lost sight of. Proverbs chapter 11. <laughs> this, this was the reality. They lost sight of this. And young people, brothers and sisters, when we sin, we lose sight. Of this reality. Proverbs 11. <coughs> and what a picture this is. Just one imagines in your mind. Proverbs 11. Verse 22. This is the reality. As a jewel of gold in a swine's snout, so is a fair woman which is without discretion. Now, you know, brothers and sisters and young people, that word discussion there is used several times in the Word of God. This word discretion. Bathsheba was a stunningly beautiful woman. She had a dedicated, noble, spiritual husband. But as a jewel of gold in a swine's snout, so is a fair woman, which is without discretion. Do you know the Hebrew word here, discretion, is perception. Perception. The golden jewel in the snout of a, of, a, of a pig. They just don't belong together. Bathsheba, in this instance, lacked the perception to stand up and to say to David, David, this is going to lead you and me to a pig's trough. They don't go together. And that word discretion there, used in Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 22, is used 13 times in the Old Testament, this word discretion. 13 times, and the only place it is used of another woman, the only place it is used of a woman, not another woman, the only place, the 13 times this word discretion is used, the only place it is used of a woman is in 1 Samuel 25. 13 times, discretion. Discretion. And the only place where it's attached to a woman's name is 1 Samuel 25. What a woman we have here. 1 Samuel 25. Pick up the record in verse 32 and 33. Discretion. 30 times. The only place here where it's attached to a woman. Verse 32. And David said to Abigail, 
Blessed be Yahweh, God of Israel, which sent thee this day to meet me. And blessed be thy discretion. There's the word. Blessed be thy discretion. And blessed be thou, which has kept me this day from coming to shed blood and from avenging myself with my own. Oh, look at the discretion of this woman. Brothers and young people, look at the discretion of this woman. You pick it up there in verse 18. Look at the detail. Verse 18. Then Abigail made haste and took 200 loaves and two bottles of wine and five sheep ready dressed and five measures of parched corn and a hundred clusters of raisins and 200 cakes of meat and lay them on the dogs. It says Abigail made haste. And the word in the Hebrew means to be liquid, it means to flow easily. There was nothing that was going to stand in the way of Abigail. Nothing was going to get up. There was something that thought David was in, he had murder. He had murder in his mind. And Abigail was going to move, move with alacrity. And she flowed like liquid, like mercury. Nothing would stop her. But <clears throat> seven times the word and is used. Each is independent. Each is important. And each is emphatic. Abigail was quick, very quick, but very thorough and very thoughtful. And, 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 and. She's quick, she's flowing like liquid, and she's thoughtful. Everything was there. What a woman. Brother said she was the earth with sin. <coughs> and that is the way we deal with sin. Quickly. And thoroughly, Bathsheba, if only you have seen David. No, my Lord, Yahweh has kept you in the statue of life. If only she had said David what Abigail had said. But that was Abigail, brothers and sisters, and this was not Bathsheba, and Bathsheba was not Abigail. Not a thing. And therefore, she came in under him, and he lay with her, and innocent blood would be shed. And we know the words of James, every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust. And when lust hath been seen, it bringeth forth sin. And when sin comes, it then bringeth forth death. And innocent lives, Uriah was innocent. The men ordered to fight beneath the wall were innocent. The child that was born was innocent. So, brothers and sisters, there then came to David. Four chilling words. I am with child. Oh, that was very inconvenient. That was very unwelcome. And the person that was responsible for that child that came into the world was not an ordinary person. He wasn't a stranger. He wasn't a nobody. He couldn't just sit away in a lane somewhere and disappear into the mist, into the darkness. He was the king. And so are we. We're kings of the making. And we, young people, brothers and sisters, when we sin, we can't just be shrunk and then disappear down an alley. The penalty for adultery was death. And David and Bathsheba were in serious trouble. What they did together, they did at night. And now they're afraid of Uriah, the light. What they did in the dark now created fear. They're frightened of the light. When you engage in hidden words, brothers and sisters and young people, hidden words of darkness, we don't look forward to the light coming home. The last word that David used when David was warned to leave this woman alone, the last word that was used was Uriah the Hittite. And you know, brothers and sisters, Uriah was a Canaanite. And they were a race of people who worshipped immorality. And he was a man who was set alight by God to reject the illicit passions of his ancestors. He was a man who lived in a society where it was common practice to have more than one wife, and all he wanted was one. Now, David in this chapter, young people and brothers and sisters, David is the Hittite. And the first person he turns to is Joab. Of all people, he turns to Joab. 
Now let's just pick up the record as we just draw together our study and the lessons that really leap out at us out of this 2 Samuel in chapter 11. So come back, if you will, to 2 Samuel in chapter 11, and we'll read these words in verse 7. David sent to Joab, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. So, the second of Samuel in chapter 7. And we read these words. Here's the interview. Now, listen to a man called out. Listen to a man desperate to escape what has happened. Listen to the interview, brothers and sisters and young people. Second of Samuel in chapter 11. And we pick up the record in verse 7. And when Uriah was come to him, David demanded of him how Joab did and how the people did and how the people <laughs> prospered. In this record, in this verse, David said, Shalom. David said, Shalom. David said, Shalom. Three times. Did, did, and prospered. Shalom. Shalom. And there's Uriah going, what's going on here? Why have you brought me back? Well, I mean, you're asking me all these questions. How will serve Joab? How the people? How's the war going? You can just imagine what's going through the mind of Uriah. David, why me? Why are you interviewing me? What's going on? And David says to him, look, Uriah, I want you to think about yourself. Well, that's a strange question. I want you to think about yourself. I've called you from the battle over here, and I want you to think about yourself. So David says in verse 8, go to your house. Oh, that's the very problem that caused all this issue. David arose and walked on the roof of the king's house. That's where all the shadows started to come from. And so, so here's David. Said, David, you're right, you go to your house. The very thing that got David in this mess in the first place. Why did you go to your house? And David talks, David talks, and David talks, brothers and sisters. He's done an awful lot of talking up till now. And quite frankly, all of it was nonsense. Uriah should have been commended. He's a noble man. He's an unselfish man, but how could David condemn him? Now look at this, brothers and sisters. Look at this. David says to this man, he's going, why, why am I here? David says to him, go down. But he went not down. He went not down. He went not down. So David the tempted becomes David the tempter. Go down. Go down. He didn't go down. And therefore, brothers and sisters, the question is asked, why? David says to your why didn't you go down? And Uriah said, first words, the ark. Last words, I will not do this thing. You see that? First words of Uriah, the ark. The last words of Uriah, I will not do this thing. God is foremost in my mind. I will not go down. David, brothers and sisters, is now facing a man who was centred on the presence of God and therefore self-denial followed. God first, self-denial follows. You know, brothers and sisters and young people, there's a lesson here for you and me. There are times when those who practice self-denial become thorns in the sides of those who want to make the best of both worlds. Have you experienced that? Have you ever been in the presence and you're not really tracking too well? You kind of have been in a bit of a misty place and you hear people that are making sacrifices for the truth. You hear people that are dedicated. Does it make you feel oh, awkward, uncomfortable? like a thorn in your side? There are times when those who practice self-denial, with God first in their minds, they become thorns in the sides of those who want to make the best of both worlds. And here was another wall. God placed in front of him. Go down. Now look at this as we draw our thoughts to a conclusion. Look at the way the Bible just shows it. Like David's tempting him. David's tempting him. Now look at this, brothers. He says to Uriah, tarry, go down. You see, David tarried. You see what he says to Uriah? He says, at even, he made him drunk. It was evening time. 
David's saying, go down. I want you to go down the same path as me. Go down. And he's trying to get him drunk. He's trying to desensitize his moral filter. He's trying to cloud your eyes' moral filter. Brothers and sisters and young people, a drunk Uriah behaved better than a sober David in this instance. What a sad, sad situation. But he wouldn't cooperate. Now, I want to finish on this note and ask the question. With all this going on, you know what Job said? You know the story. Job says, go back to David, tell him it's all done. Your eyes gone. I've obeyed you. I've laid the litter. Just make sure when you go to David, David goes, oh, what have you done? What have you put them at the wall for? You know the story, brothers. Just tell him. Just recount this. Now, have you asked yourself the question? Verse 20. Why does this historic incident of Abimelech appear here? And if we so that the king's wrath arise, said Joab to the messenger, say to him, Wherefore, if David says, why did you approach the wall? Why did you approach so nigh to the city? Don't you know that they would shoot for the wall? Who smote Abimelech and the son of Jeshabasheth? Did not a woman cast a piece of a millstone upon him from the wall that he died in Thebes? Why weren't you nigh to the wall? Look at that, brothers and sisters, young people. A woman? Now, I want to finish on this note. I want you to come back with me. I want you to come back with me to Judges. Chapter 9, and read these words. Judges chapter 9, why is it so given here? Here's another historical event to just, to just trigger in the mind of David to come back to God. Well, Judges chapter 9, <coughs> we read these words. As soon as I get Judges. I'm starting to slow down, you know, brothers and sisters. After all these weeks. <coughs> now, Jeff 6, we're going to get some numbers. Do you remember what you did? Okay, I've got it. We're all there. I shouldn't be there. So we all should be here. What are we doing here? All right, brothers and sisters and young people, Judges chapter 9. Look at this, verse 52. This, this is the, a little couple of verses just slipped in here in 2 Samuel chapter 11. Listen to the echo. And Abimelech came unto the tower and fought against it and went hard unto the door of the tower. Well, that's Second Samuel chapter 11 and verse 53. And a certain woman, that was what David did when he was leaning idly on the balustrade. There was a woman. There was a woman. It was a woman. He inquired after the woman. Well, here's a woman. A certain woman cast a piece of millstone upon Abimelech's head and all to break his skull. And what did he do? He called hastily unto the young man, his armor bearer, and said unto him, Draw thy sword, slay me, that men may not say of me, a woman slew me. You have a king, you have a woman, and you have a sword. Interesting how it's just slipped in to 2 Samuel and chapter 11. A sword was used to hastily cover up the fact that a woman brought down the king. Reputation at all costs. David, we love him so much. And God put that record there, brothers and sisters, and all those lessons contained therein for you and me. What do you think about when you can think about what you want to think about? Interesting question. And David, thankfully, thought a lot about God. And we finish our study this evening on these beautiful words. No longer David the tempter. No longer David the tempter. David the forgiver. Psalm 32, verses 10 through 11. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked. He wrote that with a pen of passion. But he that trusteth in Yahweh, mercy shall compass him about. Wrap yourself round for the whole armour of God. Be glad in Yahweh and rejoice, ye righteous, and shout for joy, all ye that are upright in heart. No longer the slothful man without heart or without feeling. He, David, spiraled out of that by having those lessons deeply imprinted on his mind. And may we, brothers and sisters, in these last days and young people, ever, ever, don't tread down the walls. Recognize the walls when God puts them in front. Recognize them. 
God's working in our life, providentially, to bring us into the kingdom that we pray very soon will <coughs>